and uh, to uh, to finish this track uh, on let's say the, the future of um, of API the, the new API stack, we will have a talk about APIs in real time data from uh, David and Sri from uh, Data Stacks. Uh, so I will invite them to join me on stage. Hello, David. Hello, Sri. How are you? Hey, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for being there with us. Uh, the real-time topic is uh, an important topic. We had Aliana starting uh, setting up the stage for you, but now it's time to talk about yes, how we handle it on the the, the data side and how we make it things real real time. So the stage is yours for twenty minutes, and we'll be we'll be back for questions. Fantastic. So quick. Uh... Quick introductions, uh, David Anjayek. Uh, I've been in API business for uh, well over a decade. I actually was the first go-to-market person at Apigee. Um, spent a lot of time on uh, API business models and API strategy in telecoms and in financial services, all the way through our IPO and acquisition by Google. Um, Sri, can you quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, good to be here. My name is uh, Sri. Uh, I'm a data architect with Datastacks. And really, I uh, take a look at you know, within financial services, how can we enable customers on your data journey? Fantastic. So um, I have I have three quick points, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sri. Um, first off, somebody who spent uh, over a decade in APIs, uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, your API strategy is also your data strategy. And you can't really think about an effective API strategy without also thinking about data. And this should be obvious to everybody. We're going to do a little bit of uh, APIs 101, though, just to, just to be sure. Uh, when we think about REST APIs, it's representative uh, representational state transfer, and uh, you know we're transferring state. State is typically stored in a database, and when we look at the REST verbs, they map very neatly uh, to database operations, the CRUD operations that we all know. And so it should be quite obvious. Um, even if we take a look at uh, open banking API where we're getting account information, you can see uh, the very valuable uh, data that is being returned uh, by uh, this API. And you might be thinking, well, what about payments? Because that's really more of a transaction, right? And payments is often said to just be secure customer authentication and uh, ledger entries, right? And so that's more transactional. It really has less to do with data. However, there's context. And you think about all the context around a payment and all the different kinds of data that you can have that describes uh, the payment, right? There really is quite a lot. Now, the catch is not all of this data is necessarily tied to the transaction itself because it is contextual there is a lot of metadata a lot of it is maybe sourced from someplace else right but in in totality there's actually quite a lot of data that's even associated with something like a transactional payment so when we step back whether it's uh, account information payments or or your particular use case and we think about uh, all the different use cases and rich interactions that we can have right they all involve quite a lot of data, right? And so that's really um, a main thing to, to think about, right? Uh, and not all of that data is necessarily attached directly to that particular transaction or interaction itself. A lot of it's contextual. But there's also one other thing that's really important about all these use cases, and that's the timing and speed, right? Because you can't uh, necessarily have fraud detection if the fraudster has already walked out of the store with the goods. You can't have uh, affordability or credit approval checks, right? If you're a buy now, pay later provider and um, you're trying to increase back basket size or increase uh, sales uh, and yet it's taking too long, you'll end up uh, having more abandonment than you'll have increased sales, right? And, and it goes without saying that the you know, personalization and recommendations need to happen in the moment while the transaction is happening. And so really that is the third point is that uh, many of the use cases that you think about for embedded finance uh, are extremely time dependent. 
So we're working with uh, a bank in, in uh, Northern Europe. And you know, part of their what they told us was that the time budget they have, the latency budget they have for an instant payment is five seconds. Five seconds round trip from the initiation out to the uh, uh, receiving bank and confirmation back in total. And so uh, when you start shrinking that down and slicing it, uh, you know, you blink in about 300 milliseconds, you can recognize something uh, in about 30 milliseconds. And most of our SLAs to return uh, affordability information or to write uh, data for fraud detection are single millisecond, single digit millisecond. And so when you think about gathering contextual data for your API, making decisions to make some of these use cases possible, you really need to think about data in the moment and how can you either read or write that data in single uh, digit millisecond time. So I've made three points so far. Your API strategy is tied to your data strategy. You have to think about contextual data, not just necessarily the data that you have, but everything around that transaction or interaction. And you have to think about speed. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Shri, who's going to show you how to actually do this. Shri? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, let me just. Okay, got it. So can you hear me and see me okay? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Okay, great. Sounds good. So yeah, thanks, David. So um, one of the um, other things I'm going to you know make give a little bit of a technical talk here. So um, if you're a developer that is producing you know, some of these APIs who's responsible for a build out, there is a couple of things that you really have to uh, you know, think about, right? So you have to um, you know, be involved with data of different types. David talked about you know, being, you know, taking the round trip and getting data. And within the network, there are processors, there are aggregators of data. Each of them can store data in different ways. And as a developer, you'll have to uh, figure out how to interact with data that comes in different, you know, shapes and sizes. Um, and you know, predominantly from an API perspective, you don't necessarily care how the data is stored. You're primarily concerned about how do you retrieve it and how can you work with it. Um, and also, I mean, there is, uh, you know, not a you know shortage of languages and you know, new query languages and tools that come about. So you're not really inclined as a developer to keep learning new things all the time. What you do care about is the availability of the system uh, to have it always have an uptime, uh, it being very performant and it being able to scale with the volume of data that we add, right? So end of the day, what you need as a developer you know, building a modern app is a modern API stack. Um, and you know, here is a quick um, you know, walk through in terms of how we see you know, apps, right? So, so there are legacy apps that are really, you know, pumping data into the system of record. Data these days are not any more batched. Uh, they get streamed in real time through a changed data capture process. And what really happens is the interaction that you have when you make a swipe on the credit card is really with a system of engagement, which is what is powering all of your digital experiences in terms of modern apps. But not only the apps that you write, which are microservices based, but also to be able to um, provide this data as an API to your external partners. So oftentimes in this you know, sort of supply chain that happens you know, when you make a swipe and the data comes back, this data is sent in real time to somebody else on the outside of your banking network or your you know, financial network. I mean, so they come back with the data. You have to transpose all of the data to be able to say yes or no for a particular transaction. So speed you know, truly is of the essence here. And also, so, so that truly is what when we think about data and then being able to enable the data through APIs is really what we call as a fast data layer. So all of this is system performance. So really the um, you know, bullets I have here, one and two, are around high throughput in terms of being able to capture transactions, also provide a low latency in terms of read, in terms of single digit millisecond. But, but there is another way to think about fast 
you know, in terms of enabling you as a developer to be able to be very agile, nimble and productive so that you're not building a lot of API infrastructure if the data platform can give that to you out of the box. So that's another way of us, you know, to really think about what a fast data layer is to get you up and running as quick as we can. So, you know, what then happens is that when you try to think from a consumer of the API, so there are a couple of ways. I mean, the data is obviously stored in a database, um, you know, or also, I mean, these days what happens is data is in motion, but the access to the data is, you know, twofold. One of them is the direct access to the data. Perhaps if you're working from a, from the perspective of a data engineer, you're really writing a data API that is exposing all of the data elements that are sitting in the database. Um, however, totally different process when you start, start thinking about if you're the business, you know, working with the business analysts, if you're working with the line of business, they are thinking about leveraging the same data for a different purpose. So, for example, in a banking setup, um, if you're somebody that is writing a mobile app, you know, for a retail bank, you may access the same data API, but you may showcase the data slightly differently. Um, as opposed to somebody who is working in marketing that has access to the same data, but what they need to do in terms of upselling and cross-selling may be quite different. So that is where we see a distinction on a set of programmers building out the domain API and a set of people working on the data API. But anything that we provide in terms of you know, being able to um, you know, bring that speed, agility, and productivity, that is you know, quite helpful. And um, so one of the um, you know things that I want to talk about um, is you know what people are building in you know you know is really how do you think about a data fabric? How do you think about a data gateway um, or a data federation layer that really you know prevents you from having to think about where is my data stored? How am I going to get to my data? Rather focus on building your apps based on the tools and technologies that you most you know are comfortable with what makes sense for your company. So, you know, you could be coding in, you know, Java, C, you know, C++, you know, Python, what have you. And you could use a variety of API interfaces, but still get access to the same data. Um, so a lot of these applications are purpose built and they are purpose driven. And you really try to use what makes sense for you the most, right? So from an API perspective, um, you know, what is expected of providers is being able to interact with the database, both at the schema level, in terms of setting up the tables, in terms of creating indexes, and do essentially all of the data operations or a database setup operations via APIs. And then obviously the second part of it is, you know, the interaction of the data itself to be able to do all of your CRUD operations with data through API. So that's really, you know, how, um, you know, people are looking to build out as an API provider. And, you know, the company that we work for, um, you know, Cassandra is the database that, you know, predominantly is used in all of these real time and, you know, high speed transactions. And we've built a layer called Stargate that provides this API interface on top of it. So what I'll do is to uh, walk you through a couple of quick demos in terms of high how we have tightly coupled the API layer with the data layer so that you're able to take a look at this. And as I'm gonna go through, I will walk you through a REST API for data that you get from a customer. Um, I will also walk you through GraphQL and really you know, showcase the point of how GraphQL solves the problem of overfetching and underfetching by REST protocols. Um, I'll explain that in a second when, as I walk through it, but at a, very high level, what overfetching does is that in REST APIs, imagine if you have about 100 fields in the database, the REST protocol is going to get you all of the fields regardless of if you want it or not. What it ends up doing is creating more traffic on the network, more data for you to consume, parse, interpret, and figure out. One of the other things that REST you know, does not do very well is, you know, it does, you know, it sort of makes you make multiple calls to the server and then you're really increasing the traffic in terms of going back and forth to the server so one of the things that graphql also solves is the underfetching problem by rest by giving you data from a combination of data sources so i'll walk you through both of these examples where i'm going to get data you know via rest protocol you know to get customer information i'll get you account information i'll also showcase the same thing where GraphQL is solving the overfetching problem 
by doing this as well as underfetching problem. Um, the other thing that we do is that, you know, from an API perspective, sometimes you may you have to use a schema-less approach to build out your, you know, uh, tech stack. So a document API comes in pretty handy so that you don't have to think about ahead of time and tightly bind your APIs to a data structure and, a, you know, fields in the database. So the schema-less option with do document API comes in pretty handy. Um, so let me sort of, you know, just, you know, switch context and walk you through the application. Um, so what I'll do is I'll quickly show you a, a REST program. So, so for some of you that are, you know, technical or even if you're not very technical, so this should be, uh, what we're really doing is to tightly couple, I have a database table called customer profile by customer ID and I don't really have to do anything else besides enabling this as a REST API, and I can easily access this from my system. So let me just showcase that in a second, and I'll jump over to the next protocol after that. So here is an example of I am getting data in a table and you know from a coding perspective all i have to do is to specify my table name and that's pretty much it and you know so the the benefit that we provide by providing this api layer is you don't have to sit and think about how do i build a data access layer for you to expose similarly if i just switch my table name and then i go to a different um, table here you can see that i can quickly get all of the data from the account table here just by switching the table context. So if you had 100 tables, you are not building out an API by table. The system automatically provides all of that. Well, that's all great. So let's you know think about this from a GraphQL perspective, right? So if I try to take a look at um, customer information on GraphQL, so I, I want to quickly show this to say, in this example, I am not interested. I talked a little bit about overfetching with REST. In REST, you're not able to denote from your provider what fields are you most interested in. But in a, in a table like GraphQL, I specifically am interested in just the first name, last name, and phone number in this particular situation. So I can specify what fields am I particularly interested with as a part of my API. So we leave it completely up to the domain API provider. So as I talked about, somebody writing a marketing app may be interested in just this, but somebody that is building out a app that is more for e-commerce or something else may be interested in a different set of fields. So this is how GraphQL provides a better ability for you to you know, be pick and choose what fields you want. The second problem with REST is, um, you know, so this problem of overfetching, um, I'm sorry, underfetching. So if I just open up this, you know, transaction, now I am able to look at three different tables. I'm passing three different parameters to say I'm interested in getting the data from this particular customer um, across these set of tables, and I can try to get the data for that. So if I quickly go here and um, select this. So what you see here is that I've got the data for a particular customer and all of his accounts, his account balances, and all of the transactions that just posted. So instead of me having to make three separate calls, in effect, what I've done is to make one call that returns me what I want. So context becomes very critical. You know, it becomes very crucial so that you're not bringing a lot of data that you don't need. You're not also making multiple hops to the network through the network for you to bring the data because every hop that you make presumably has to travel over the internet and come back down. So you're trying to optimize you know, what you can. So that's one of the uh, benefits that we see with people adopting GraphQL as a platform. The um, other thing that I wanted to show you was, let me just log in into this um, you know, portal. Um, Astra is a database that we provide as a service to run Cassandra. And if I just quickly go here, and I will just talk to you about the API access. So you can see here that you know while there is ability to access the data through a driver or through a you know SQL CQL protocol, um, you know we additionally provide. I talked about the REST APIs and GraphQL, 
we also provide document API for you to go and build. If you're more familiar with the document API and if you want to do schema less binding, you can do that. And one of the other things that you know we look to provide um, any provider these days from an API is to really provide you the sort of you know swagger UI documentation where everything is pretty clear in terms of if you had to work with document API, if you had to work with the schemas itself to figure out how to add tables to a column, you have to create a new table. All of this is possible just through an API interface without having to work with a DBA, without having to write scripts. So that comes in very, very handy. So as an example, if I just open this up, it really walks you through how to use a GraphQL format to go ahead and you know create a data itself, create a table that will hold the data. And once it is created, it is automatically available for consumption via API. So that's one thing that I wanted to point out here is that, you know, you know, much like any other premier API provider, so we are, you know, giving access to all APIs for you to do all schema development, but also to work with any data, there's versioning available in API. So one of the other benefits of using APIs is that as we incrementally work on this, we can look to provide newer versions of API so that you can still be compatible with, you know, older programs, you know, if you have to but keep up with you know, some of the innovation that we're doing with version two, three, four, and so on and so forth, right? So that way you don't have to do a lot of operational you know, activities on your end and it, it sort of works out very well. Um, so that's on the um, you know, API, the Swagger documentation. So the last thing that I also wanted to show was, uh, and I talked a little bit about GraphQL. So what we also provide as a part of the tool is to, before you productionize any of your code, make all of the GraphQL APIs available for you to go take a look at it here, right? So it makes it very easy for you as a developer to start working on this data platform. So we're really, you know, making the data platform and API platform a lot more, you know, combined and intertwined so that you don't have to think about API as a separate stack on top of your data stack, right? So that's really, um, you know, our goal behind this and, uh, so I kind of just walked you through how to do a REST API, how to do GraphQL, how GraphQL is solving the overfetching, underfetching problem. In addition, give you schemaless JSON with document API and being able to do any type of API, you know, using the API, doing any type of activities, both in terms of database operations as well as just interacting with the data. So, um, you know, I think that that's sort of, uh, what we wanted to cover, you know, in terms of prepared questions, um, you know, prepared, you know, conversations, but, you know, happy to, um, you know, David, for you to close out and then, you know, take any questions from the team. No, that's great. So, you know, as, as you can see, um, your data layer is just the other side of your API layer. And as, as you think about enabling uh, API services, you should also be thinking about you know, how do you uh, deliver data quickly, both from the developer of the API as well as from the consumer? Yeah, thank you very much. We have uh, some questions about uh, GraphQL, actually. Uh, would you recommend GraphQL for public APIs? Yeah, see, um, so there is definitely an element of security, and we take security regardless of we expose a GraphQL API, document API, or REST API. So we have the same standards when we have to, uh, you know, enable these. We do use GraphQL, and we've seen, you know, wider adoption as people are thinking about interchanging data. For example, we also work with Apollo GraphQL Federation in terms of being able to read data, right? So, you know, it makes it easier, it makes it more efficient compared to the REST protocol. So we do, you know, see adoption, you know, in the public domain as well. We also have a question about monitoring GraphQL requests. Uh, as it's really different than the, let's say, REST CRUD-based uh, uh, APIs. Like, did you have any, do you know any market product who are able to monitor all the requests in a way that's uh, the, where people can actually get inside from it? So you, how to monitor requests that come to GraphQL? Yeah, you know, uh, GraphQL, every time you do a specific request on a schema, it's one, one request in a sense, where REST, it's, per endpoint. So when you have 20 endpoints, you people can have only 20 endpoints that they can uh, actually uh, 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 request. So it's easier to monitor with GraphQL. You you can have 
multiple combination of the of the, of the schema in the fields. So I, I think this is what's covered here. Right. So I, what? I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, David. I was just gonna say. I mean, I'm obviously slightly biased, but um, you, you, I saw an announcement that uh, Apigee is supporting GraphQL. So that might be one place because that was always a strong point of Apigee was a, a robust monitoring solutions. And uh, Sri, I don't know if you have a, a, another thing to add to that. Yeah. No. I mean, it's so it is up to the provider, right? So what what we will what people are doing is to make sure that even though one GraphQL translates to a few different REST endpoints, to be able to track all of that, log all of that, so that you can see things over time, right? So, you know, so there is a motion to uh, you know use it because it is easy, but it puts a little bit of onus on the provider to be able to provide all of these additional overlays. But end of the day, you make it more productive in terms of usage, and then really you know, empower the developer. And the previous talk was about developer being the super, you know, consumer, super customer. So it's all about the developers, we get it. So we're trying to make their life easy. We have a question about the Stargate. Uh, some, someone is asking, is it open source and where we can find it? Yes, yeah, stargate.io. So it is an open source product. Um, you know, Datastax is the uh, premier committed to the product. It is open source. So it works currently across any flavor of Cassandra, um, be it open source Cassandra, Datastax Enterprise, or uh, you know Astra, which is our cloud you know Cassandra platform. Um, and the goal for Graph, you know, Stargate. It, Stargate also links with Apollo GraphQL Federation. And the goal for us with Stargate is twofold. One of them is extended to other data sources. I mean, database. The second goal is to make it available for both data at rest as well as data in motion. So what you'll see, you know, over time, Datastax doing is that a developer should not have to worry about where is my data, is the data at rest or is it in motion? He should just be able to get the data and then, you know, build insights on top of it. So that's our goal with that. So stargate.io is the website. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Three and David. We reached the time allocated for 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 the event. And again, if you want to know more about uh, Stargate or Datastax, you can go on their website or at least go in the expo booth area where uh, they are actually uh, uh, having a booth there. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us.